It gives me great pleasure to introduce <laughs> Debbie Kennett. Uh, Debbie is, uh, has been a genealogist for many, many years and has been a genetic genealogist almost since the beginning. Debbie runs the Cruise One Name Study, um, is a member of the Guild of One Name Studies and has used uh, genetic genealogy and DNA testing very successfully in her particular project. So much so that she's written several books on the topic. Uh, DNA and Social Networking is one of the books. And the Surname Handbook is the other one, and you can get those on Amazon. Well worth the buy. Debbie Kennedy, ladies and gentlemen. The subject of my talk today is chromosomes, conquerors, and castles. I'm going to be talking about my one name study in my DNA project, which covers the surname Cruz, spelt C R U W Y S which was my maiden name, and some of the other variant spellings that are associated with it. Before I start, I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of background about my Irish connection in my family history. My grandfather, Herbert Frederick Cruz, went on a holiday to Ireland in uh, 1912, and he actually fell in love with the country so much that he decided he wanted to come and live here. This is his marriage certificate dating from 1914 and he married in Heston in Middlesex and you can see from the certificate that his address at the time of the marriage was 34 Princes Street in Cork. He was a tailor and this is his shop in Cork which was actually at number 34 Princes Street. This photograph was taken when two of his brothers came over to visit him and my grandfather is the one on the right of the picture there with the moustache looking a bit like Hercule Poirot. My father and his three elder brothers were all born in Cork. This is the house they were born at. Um, it's at number one Warburton Villas, which I believe is the house there. And because my father was born in Ireland, I could, if I wanted, have an Irish passport. It's not something, something I've ever tried to pursue. But one of my uncles decided to have both an Irish and an English passport and he said that he actually found it better to have an Irish passport when he was visiting many countries. It seems to be much more acceptable to be Irish than English sometimes. And what we're going to be looking at today are some of the results from my one name study into the surname Cruz and the other variant spellings and the findings from the DNA project. I'm going to take a look at the problem of variant spellings, which is a particular problem with my own one name study. I will also be looking at surname mapping, which is a useful way of looking at the distribution of a surname and providing a geographical focus for your research. And I will conclude with some success stories from my DNA project, looking at three particular variant spellings of the surname. I first became interested in my family history when I was a child and we went on a holiday to Cornwall and on the way to Cornwall we stopped off at the small parish of Cruz Morchard in North Devon and of course the, the, the uh, parish had the same name as my surname so I thought it was really exciting to have my name on a signpost. There was not very much in the parish itself. Um, other than the church and a few scattered farmhouses and there was also a manor house where the Cruz family lived. My father wanted to knock on the door and introduce himself but my mother decided she, it, that wasn't a good idea so we did not get to meet the Cruz family who were living at the house at that time. It was not until many years later that I finally had the chance to start researching my family history the starting point of my research was the Cruz Morchard notebook, which I've been told had the whole history of our family in it. I'd, uh, when I tried to find a copy of the book, I was told that my grandfather used to have a copy and it was supposed to be up in the loft, but when I went to find it, it was no longer there. And then it transpired that one of my cousins had borrowed the book and had never ever returned it. I eventually managed to track a copy down on eBay and uh, the book did indeed go right back to the doomsday period and it started with a history of the family with the earliest reference being from 1175. But the book ended in the 1800s and it didn't mention anyone in my family tree at all. I 
did a bit more research on the crew's surname. There was a, an old rhyme from Devon which uh, read Crocker, Cruise and Copplestone, when the Conqueror came, were at home. But there was no reference to the surname in the Doomsday Book. The earliest reference we could find dated back to 1166, when an Otwell de Cruise held half fee in the parish of Cruise Morchard. The Cruises have been lords of the manor of Cruise Morchard continuously from that time right through to the present day. They are one of the very few families who can boast such a long line of succession in a single location. The family records are still held at Cruise Morchard House. The collection comprises around about two and a half thousand documents, including lots of manor court rolls. The earliest document in the collection dates back to about 1200 and it's known as the Tracy Deed. And this document is signed by Richard de Cruz and Alexander de Cruz. You can probably just about make out their signatures in this extract from the document there. I then had to go back to the traditional way of researching and start at the present and go back and research each generation back in time. My grandfather, Herbert Frederick Cruz, was born in Bristol in 1886. His father, Frederick Cruz, was also born in Bristol and the censuses showed that the next generation, Thomas Cruz, was born in the village of Burrington in North Devon. I got very excited at this point because when I looked at the map I could see that Burrington was just a short distance from Cruz Morchard. But as I researched the tree further and further back in time, uh, we traced the tree through various um, neighbouring parishes. The tree went backwards and forwards from Ash Rainey back to Burrington again. And then we had a nice run in the parish registers of Winkley. And I could take the tree right back to the 1600s. And then I got to a Hannibal Cruise with a very unusual uh, forename. And he married in 1597 in Winkley, a lady by the name of Christoph Harrell. But at that point I reached a brick wall. I couldn't find a baptism for Hannibal. And in fact, the baptismal records for Winkley only commenced in 1585, which was just that little bit too late for to find any record of Hannibal's baptism. I then turned to other records to see if I could find some way of connecting my family to Cruz Morchard. Um, although the baptisms hadn't survived, the burials and marriages, they started from 1569, and the earliest record in the burial register dated from 1596, which was the burial of a Thomas Cruz. And with somebody written in the register, Fra, which I believe is from the Latin frater, brother, of Humphrey of Morchard. <coughs> um, so it seemed that this uh, Thomas Cruz was pro probably the brother of, of uh, related to the Cruz Morchard line. And then we also had records from the muster rolls and the, the lay subsidy rolls, the tug of tax. And there was a Thomas Cruz who appeared in these records. The G stands for goods, seven pounds worth of goods. L stands for land. Three, uh, he was assessed with land to the value of three pounds, three pounds and seven pounds, they were huge sums of money in those days. So they were, this Thomas Cruz was obviously from a very well-to-do family, but I just could not connect my Hannibal with the Thomas. It just seemed that was the most likely, um, that was seemed to be the most likely um, proposition. I then turned to the Herald's visitations. The, there's the, the College of Arms in England is the um, authority. If you want to uh, bear a coat of arms, you have to have the, 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 uh, the, the right to bear arms um, bestowed on you by the College of Arms. And they had heralds who would travel around the country, uh, and in the old days they would travel around on horseback, and they would go and visit the gentry families who, who had the right to bear arms, and they would check their pedigrees. And these pedigrees have all been published, um, in uh, various books, and they did these visitations at um, different uh, intervals. And this is the visitation, the, uh, the entry in the visitations to the Cruz Morchard family from Devon. And then on here you can see there is a John Cruz who married an Anne, uh, the daughter of Humphrey Keynes of Winkley, who was a, a gent. And um, even better, when I looked at this record, there was a Thomas Cruz, who was the son of uh, John Cruz and Anne Keen. So again, it's, it, all the records seem to be pointing to the fact that this Thomas Cruz was my Cruz from Winkley, but I just couldn't prove it one way or the other. <coughs> I then looked at the, uh, the Keynes um, family tree, and they were 
uh, uh, they're a very well-to-do family in, in Winkley. The Winkley itself was once uh, was once divided. There were two manors. There was one called Winkley Keynes and one called Winkley Tracy. They had a castle in uh, Winkley, which was called Court Castle, which sadly is now in a state of ruins. There's all that, that can be seen is the a sort of raised mound in the uh, in, in the, the landscape there. And when Charles Worthy wrote about the, 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 the um, parish in the 1800s, he described the, the two castles now ruinated by time and overgrown with tall trees. So at this point I decided to broaden my searches and to, rather than just to try and look at my own family, to try and broaden the picture and look at everyone with a surname so that's really what, what a one-name study is. So you're not studying just your own surname, you're studying the family history of everyone with a surname. And my hope was that by looking at the wider picture, I might be able to um, find a breakthrough, to find a way of connecting my family with the Proof Orchard family. So I registered, uh, registered my name with the Guild of One-Name Studies back in 2006. Um, the Guild gives you a very nice little profile page where you can describe your study and that helps to bring in lots of inquiries for me from people all around the world who are searching the, the surname. And I then added another variant, the spelling C-R-U-S-E, and then I eventually added the variant C-R-U-I-S-E. I decided to establish a blog, um, which uh, again I found a very useful way of just keeping track of my research and just publishing little stories as and when they occurred to me. And that was also a very um, good way of collaborative working and just bringing in inquiries from other people. And I would find people comment on the blog or they would, call, they would just email me because they'd seen something that I'd written. So that was a very good way of bringing me a network of researchers from around the, the world. And then in September 2007, I decided I wanted to start a DNA project. Um, the, one, of the main, whoops, one of the main reasons for starting that project, um, a number of members of the Guild of One Name Studies were also running DNA projects. When I first joined the Guild, the first journal I received, there was a big article from one of our members, Susan Meats, who was the, one of the very early pioneers of DNA testing, and she'd written all about her project. And another Guild member, Chris Pomery, had written the first ever book on DNA testing, and he's done a very thorough study of the, the Pomeroy surname. And I actually went along to one of his talks, and it was after going to one of his talks, I decided I wanted to do my own project. So um, this is the, the state of my documentary research. Um, with a, a DNA project, it's, the DNA does not work on its own. The DNA and the documentary research work um, side by side. I keep all my records in, I use a program called Family Historian. And I'm now up to 17,000 individuals in that uh, programme, uh, divided into 96 different trees. Um, at the moment, I keep the Americans in a different database because I was hoping someone might help me with the American research, but that's never, ever happened. I've ended up doing all that myself. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the backbone of a, a one-name study are the, the, the indexes from the birth, marriage and death um, Indexes in England and Wales, we've got the General Register Office indexes, and in Ireland, you've got the uh, you've got the Irish Civil Registration indexes. So I've collected all of those, and that actually serves as a baseline so that I can keep track of how many people I've got in different trees and how many people I still have to allocate to trees. And I can work out, say, if I get a death certificate for someone, and if there are two people with the same surname, I know by elimination if I've allocated one death certificate, the other death record must refer to the other person. I also had contact with another researcher who was researching the surname Cruz, C-R-U-S-E, and he shared all his research with me, and I've effectively taken over his research. I had to do a lot of, spend a lot of time inputting all his research all over again, because his, his was done in the days before computers, and he had all these printouts of family trees that I had to write all over again. So when I started doing the DNA project, I knew that there was no way I could possibly study every single surname and all the different variant spellings in the same detail that I was doing with my own particular surname. But the DNA project is a good way of exploring all these different variant spellings. And this is the picture that, uh, from my research and from the DNA project we're, we're sort of coming to now, we've got the Cruz spelling, my particular spelling, um, actually appeared very early on in the Cruz Mortuary Parish registers. But in a lot of other lines, it only started to appear in the likes of late 1700s, early 1800s. And you can sometimes see in the parish registers the name changing. And someone would be born with the name spelled C-R-U-S-E, 
and then suddenly they might be borrowed and their name would be spelt C-R-U-W-Y-S. So and once they've got that name, they seem to stick to it and then it was used in all subsequent records unless it was misspelt in the census. And then the, the spelling C-R-U-S-E, that seemed to have a different evolution and sometimes there was um, the spelling <coughs> C-U-R-S and that evolved to Cruz in some instances. In Wiltshire we had a line that we changed from Cruz to Screws. And then in Ireland um, we've got this spelling C-R-U-I-S-E. America is a, another problem in its own right because uh, the surname over there seemed to start as Crew without an S and then they seem to add an S to it and then they used C-R-E-W-S and C-R-U-S-E. And then you've also got the problem of um, the, all the immigrant surnames. There was one um, name I came across where the name Gruss, the German name, was anglicised to Cruz. Now I find mapping is a very useful way of, uh, first of all, establishing the size of a, a surname and sort of seeing where you should focus your research and also seeing which variant spellings might be related. For this, I've used a programme called um, Surname Atlas. It's a special <coughs> programme for, uh, developed by Steve Archer. Um, if it was something you're interested in, the Guild of One Name Studies um, do actually sell this uh, software. It takes data from the 1881 census for England, Wales and Scotland. Unfortunately, there's nothing that will do the whole of the British Isles all in one go. Um, obviously, there's no records for 1881 from Ireland, and there's nothing that will do the 1901 census. It's all in one go at the moment. But you can see from this, the surname Cruz has got a very, very strong um, concentration in the southwest of England, and particularly in Devon. But the variant Cruz is much more widespread across the whole of the southeast of England, and also there's a, a, a concentration up in Lancashire. So it's um, just looking at this, it seems as though Cruz probably is a surname that has a single origin, but Cruz, and there is going to be some overlap with Cruz, but Cruz probably has a number of different origins, the, the C-R-U-S-E spelling. And then we look at the other variants, they again have got completely different distributions. Um, C-R-E-W-E-S is found almost exclusively in Cornwall. Um, and then the C-R-E-W-S spelling is, fa is, is, is found across the South East and again up in Lancashire. And the Irish uh, version of the name, that's got a slightly different uh, distribution again. And you can see that the, the strong point there is up north in Lancashire. Um, whenever you see a surname that's localised in Lancashire, that's usually a good indication that lots of people have um, entered uh, England via Liverpool, um, lots of Irish immigrants. Um, Howard Matheson, a member of the Guild of One Name Studies, has a very good website, so Surname Origins, um, and he actually offers a, um, a personalised mapping service. Um, he did this very nice map for me, showing the distribution of the surname in Ireland, and he did a comparison using uh, my data from the Griffiths valuation in 1858, um, sort of whatever, uh, comparing with the uh, 1901 census data. And you can see that the surname has actually been quite stable over that 50-year period um, in Ireland. It's also very widely spread around Ireland. So we've got a very strong concentration in Dublin. There's a separate concentration in um, County Mayo. And then there's also another um, hotspot down in County Clare. So it may, in Ireland, it's possibly a name that has a number of different origins. Um, I tried to do a, an account of all the different variant spellings I was encountering. These are the different variant spellings that are represented in my DNA project. And they're ranked in order by the frequency in the 1881 England and Wales census. And this is a sort of story in its own right because we, one of the problems with a lot of DNA projects is the large numbers of Americans in the database. And you can see I've got this problem here. There are actually more Americans with these different um, surname spellings then there are people in, in England, Wales and Scotland, and I, I couldn't do equivalent figures for Ireland. Um, so the, the American data does tend to rather distort a DNA project sometimes. Um, but also it's interesting, you get some names that are found in America that aren't found here, and vice versa. So I've got the variant S-C-R-U-S-E, which is only found in England and Wales, and then we've got the other name S-C-R-E-W-S, which is only found in America and not found here. And that name is actually dying out probably for obvious reasons. I've got one project member who actually was born with the name and decided he doesn't want to use it anymore, which you can rather appreciate. <laughs> and these are, this is the, the representation of people in my project by country. 
Um, I, I'm now up to 83 people, and um, I've got about 61% of the project members are from America. That's actually quite, compared to many projects, that's actually quite a, a low percentage. Um, and I've got a, a very large contingent from England. I've only got one project member from Ireland at the moment. I'm desperately hoping that I'm going to find a few more cruises while I'm here. Who, and if there are any um, who come along to the um, exhibition here, they can have a free um, Y-DNA test as part of my um, surname project. Um, I'm just going to do a quick um, run through of how the Y-DNA test um, works, just um, to explain the, the results. The Y chromosome is passed on from a father to his son, and it's passed on virtually unchanged. But every now and then you get an error in the copying process, um, and that's when a mutation arises. And these mutations can actually be quite useful because um, the Y chromosome test looks at particular locations on the Y chromosome where these mutations are likely to occur. We call these particular locations markers. And for each marker you get a number. And then your numbers go into a database and then they're compared with other people and it's like a sort of number matching game. You're hoping you, you're going to find matches with people with the same numbers as you. So the more markers you match on, the closer the relationship, and if you don't match on, if you match on too, mismatch on too many markers, then you don't share a common ancestor within what we call a genealogical time frame. So when I started my DNA project, my first, um, the, the first thing I wanted to do was to see if I could get over my brick wall and see if I could establish whether we were related to the Cruz Mortchard family. But um, there was a big problem at the first hurdle, because when I traced the, the, the family tree of the Cruz Mortchard family, I found that they were not Cruz's after all. The line had done what we call, it had daughtered out. And there was a um, uh, John Cruz who had two daughters, and his daughter Harriet Cruz had married a um, George Sharland. And what they'd done, they, um, George Sharland had changed his name by royal licence. So that he had the right to bear the, the Cruz arms and he changed his name to Cruz and then all their descendants then subsequently adopted the Cruz surname. So if I were to test the, the, the current incumbent of the manor house in um, Devon, he would actually represent the Charlin surname and not the Cruz surname. But fortunately, I made contact um, in the early stages of my research with a gentleman by the name of Tom Johns who had devoted most of his retirement to researching his family tree, and he'd found that one of his ancestors had the surname Cruz, C-R-E-W-E-S. And he went backs and forwards from Dorset to the Devon Record Office. He dug up all sorts of records. He published a, a little book with, uh, describing the history of his family, and he'd also traced his family line back to Cruz Morchard. Um, through he transcribed wills and been through, and he'd uncovered all sorts of obscure records that I would never even have dreamed of, of finding. So my theory then was, well, if I can test a living person with the surname Cruz who can um, prove that they are descended from that line, and I compare them with my father, um, then if my theory is correct, the two lines should match. So I've managed to find a living person with the surname Cruz living in Australia. His line went back, yes, his line went back to the Cornwall, and then we got to an Anthony Cruz, and Anthony Cruz um, was featured in the Herald's Visitations, and he was the son of uh, a John Cruz of Cruz Mortchard uh, by his second wife, Mary Francis. And then my line, we had the Hannibal Cruz, so I thought was the son of Thomas Cruz, and Thomas Cruz of Winkley, I thought, was the son of John Cruz of Cruz Morchard. And then he was the son of um, another John Cruz. And then that went back again to the, the John Cruz at the top of the tree uh, from his first marriage. So we had the two tests done to see what would happen, how the results would work out. And this, uh, these were the results. When they first came through, we had 12, only 12 markers. And... Um, they only matched on 10 out of 12 markers, and it really wasn't looking at all hopeful, because normally you would hope for a match on all 12 markers. But then we started to get more and more markers in, and then it actually started to look very different when we added extra markers. They matched on 23 out of 25 markers, 35 out of 37. We then ordered extra markers, we went up to 67, and even the 111 markers. The Family Tree DNA, the testing company that we use, they have a 
a tool that you can use that will generate the probabilities of two people sharing a common ancestor. The DNA doesn't give you a precise answer, it only gives you a, a range of probabilities within which the common ancestor might have lived. And these were the scores that we would get. So with a 99% chance that they share a common ancestor within 24 generations, um, is really about as good as it can get. Um, however many years you use for a generation, it's all well within the expected time frame. So it doesn't conclusively <coughs> prove that the family tree is correct, but it's certainly very good corroborative evidence in combination with all those extra documentary records that we've got. This shows the DNA project and how a project looks when you add all the extra results. Uh, with the, the proof, <coughs> we actually ended up with three different um, genetic groups or genetic families. That, that's groups that match purely on the, on the basis of the genetics, regardless of the family tree. So I've got one big group, which I think is the proof mortuary line, another group which also traces back to Devon. Um, the earliest ancestor is in Oakford, which is just a short distance from Cruz Mortred, and then another line which we believe is illegitimate, so that wasn't expected to match anyone else at all. And in the Cruz Mortred group, you'll see that there's also one person with the surname Cruz, C R U I S E, and his line is from Dublin. Um, and this is where, at the point where I started to become interested in the, the surname in Ireland, um, because this was actually quite a distant connection. Um, and at first we weren't even sure if it was an actual match. Um, and then as we started to add more markers, it looked, as, it looked more promising. So I started to look at the surname Cruz in Ireland. And uh, um, I can never pronounce his name, I'm sure someone will correct me. Edward McLeisart wrote the um, Surnames of Ireland, uh, the, 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 um, the, the standard reference work for Irish surnames. And he describes the surname in Ireland as one of the oldest hiberno Norman families. I had to look up Hiberno Norman in the dictionary because I didn't know what it meant, um, but it's an Anglo Norman family that's um, exclusive to Ireland. And the other surname dictionary, Patrick Wolfe, um, who uh, is uh, rather scorned by uh, McLeisort, but he actually gave a very nice detailed description of the surname and talked about how it would be an Anglo Norman family who came to Ireland at the time of the, the invasion. That's the Anglo Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169. And the chief seat of the family was at Knoll, where the ruins of their castle are still to be seen. It seems to be a common theme I find with my family. The castles always seem to be in ruins. <laughs> and I looked at various uh, early references to the surname in Ireland. The, the first reference that we found was in, in 11, it was dated just before 1176, and Augustino de Cruz witnessed the grant of, by Strongbo of land in Dublin. So it seems likely that the Cruises were the, one of the very early people to come across to Ireland, with, possibly even with Strongbow's army. There's, as far as I know, there are no actual records to give the names of the people who, who arrived with Strongbow, but they were <coughs> certainly here in those very early years, sometime between 1169 and, and, and uh, 1176. And then we find all sorts of early references to the surname in Ireland. One of the, but with the medieval records, a lot of them uh, are actually in fact to be found in England. And a lot of the, the medieval records were transcribed in, in the Victorian era, um, and you can actually find all the books now in the Internet Archive. So we have uh, there's the calendars of the early, early Irish records. There's a wonderful database with all the patent rolls. I found lots of references in there. And it was obvious that the, 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 the cruises in Ireland were a very uh, well, again, a, a, a baronial um, noble family. And the name is mostly spelled C-R-U-Y-S in the, the very early Irish records. But then you've got a big gap, and when you come to look at the, the family trees of living people uh, from Ireland, um, invariably those trees don't go back much before about 1800. So there seems to be lots of references in medieval records, and then you've got a sort of gap from like 1600 through to 1800, and that seems to be insurmountable. There's no way I could, we could possibly trace a tree in Ireland all the way back to 1100 as we can with, the, with my English tree. These are the DNA results. Um, so the theory is that um, we have um, a, the, the, the line in Devon and Cornwall with the two different spellings, and we think that that line is related to the Cruz family from Ireland, um, but the common ancestor would have lived sometime before that Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169. And the DNA results at the moment bear out that theory, but it's, 
it's a very, it's actually, we're actually setting a precedent because no one has actually done, the, there, there are no other trees that you can compare with where people have done a comparison of two people related at that time. And it's all done on probabilities. Um, but the probabilities, when we go up to, say, 67 markers, it gives us an 84% chance that they are related within that time frame. Um, and the, 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 the scores only go back 24 generations. We're actually going back a few more generations, and that's depending on how many years per generation you use. So we're now actually using different testing as well. We're using um, something called SNP testing, which tests um, slow mutating markers. And as, um, we're following those through to see if those match. That's something that's still developing at the moment. We've got as far as we can with that testing, but we're hoping um, at the moment that we know that both trees are um, what's called Z12, that's the, the particular marker that they share. Um, but as more and more markers are discovered, that will all come down in, in time. The Z12 marker dates back about 1,500 years. So at the moment, we're not sure, but it, it's looking likely that we possibly have a, a distant link between a, an English surname and an Irish surname. And obviously the most famous bearer of the, the Cruz surname in Ireland is Tom Cruise, but unfortunately, even if I could get his DNA, it would not be of much use to me because Cruz is not his surname. He's Thomas Cruz Mapoba, and Enneclan did the um, research on, on his family tree. His line goes back to Mary Pauline Russell Cruz, um, and she married someone with the name Mapoba. And then there were four generations of Thomas Cruz Mapobas. And they traced his tree back to um, Andrew Cruz, who died in 1780. And um, Enneclan said he was descended from the Cruises of Knoll, but they didn't actually specify how they'd managed to uh, work that out. So I've, I've never been <coughs> to, to um, uh, verify that. But if you wanted to look at Tom Cruz's ancestry, they, they, they put a, an exhibition on the Enneclan website, and they got a nice picture of yet another ruined castle, because... Um, <laughs> Cruz Town in County Meath was named after the, the Cruz family, um, and there was a castle there, but now all that remains to be seen is this, um, the, the remains of the, the Mott. Oops. Sorry, so um, so the, at the moment in my DNA project, I've got nine people with the, the, the variant spelling Cruz, C-R-U-I-S-E, <coughs> Uh, three of them are African Americans, so they're descended from the state. These are the Irish ones. So we've got the, the first one, um, his most distant known ancestor is James Cruz. He's the one who has the distant match with, the, um, the, with my particular family. And then we've got uh, all the other people that I've tested. We keep trying to get all these Cruises to test, and none of them match my particular tree. And uh, we've got three people who match no one else at all with the surname. One has lots of distant matches with lots of Irish and Scottish names. And then I've got two Canadians who match each other but don't match anyone else. So I'm still, I'm, what I'm hoping is to get more cruises to test so that we can actually try and get to establish the picture of the surname in Ireland and um, also get more people who possibly are descended from this um, very old Anglo-Norman um, surname. And then the last story I'm going to tell you is the story um, about of Henry the Cruise, the shipwreck survivor. And this was when I first started my um, surname study. Um, I was approached by someone who, whose ancestor was uh, Henry Cruz, and he had been shipwrecked off the coast of South Africa. And the story was that um, he was the only survivor from this shipwreck. He managed to swim ashore, and he um, swam to shore in this place called, uh, just off the uh, very close to Hawkston, off the South African coast. And the bay there is called Harris Bay in his honour, supposedly. When we came to look at the documentary records, the, uh, there was a death notice that we managed to get from, the, uh, from South Africa. And that told us he was 36 years old when he died. And um, his um, name was Henry Cruz. He, he was, um, his birthplace was Great Britain, which was not a great deal of help. And uh, but it only named one parent. We first, uh, the, the researcher, first of all, thought that was Harry Cruz. And he sent me on a wild goose chase for many years, searching for a Henry, son of Harry <coughs> Cruz. And that, when you actually look at it, it's, it's actually Mary Cruz. Um, so from this, we, we worked out, we had a, an approximate birth date, 1826, somewhere in Great Britain. Um, so before the censuses, and 
was, we had no clue where to go. He actually hired a researcher, spent several thousand pounds hiring a researcher to do lots of research on his surname and was getting absolutely nowhere. We kept on finding all sorts of Henrys and a lot of them were dead ends and or they would die off. And we just couldn't find any, any trace that would um, tie in with a, a South African connection. Then he was one of the first people to join my DNA project. He sat in the database for about a year and then suddenly another person tested and we had a match. And the first person who matched him was from a line that could be traced back to Berkshire. Then we had um, three more people who eventually matched a few years later and they all traced their line back to a, a small parish called Osborne St George in Wiltshire. And when I did the documentary research, we were able to um, link the Berkshire cruises with the Wiltshire cruises. So all these four people were from the same family tree that went back to that one small parish in Wiltshire. So from this, we could then deduce that this Henry Cruz somehow fits into this particular tree. And um, we've now found a location in London where we, we think he's connected to the tree, but I'm hoping to get a person from that line to test, and that's something I haven't been able to do to confirm that. And we may also be able to use the autosomal DNA testing um, if that result was positive. So that's something we're still trying to develop. But that's just to show you how a DNA test can help to hone in on a geographical area if you don't have the, the background information. Um, but it does all depend on who else is in the, the database. So in the project now, I, I, I have 83 people. Um, two of my project members have actually passed away. With a, any DNA project, it's always important to get the people to test while you still can. 24 of those people are currently singletons. They don't have any matches with the surname. But I think that will change as the project grows. Um, because what I've been trying to do is to get one person from each tree to test in the hope that they might match other ones. But then eventually we'll try and get two people from each tree to test so that we've got a, a sort of... Um, we've found, established a reference signature for each particular branch. Um, but it's, it's obviously a slow process. It takes time to, to find all the people. The largest group by far is a group of 25, and they're all Americans. This is a common feature of any surname project. You find that because of the sheer numbers of people who went to America, and also because they all tend to be quite closely related within a, um, quite a close time frame, you end up with these huge groups just full of Americans. And they're all desperately hoping that they're going to find matches over here, but none of my Americans actually match any of my British or Irish or Australian people at the moment. And we also have the, the problem of what we call NPEs, non-paternity events, or sometimes known as not the parent expected. Um, we have, sometimes the word NPE is used to describe any um, break in the link with the, the, the Y chromosome and the surname. I have got some people I know who are descended from illegitimate lines, but we have got three people who didn't match the lines that they should have matched. And in those cases, they quite often tend to match other surnames and some, in some cases they have been able to actually trace and find that their other surname was in the same area as them. Those are all in America. It seems much more difficult to do that in the UK. So just a reminder, if you know of any, if anyone has the surname Cruz or if you know of anyone with the surname Cruz, um, please get them to come and see me and I can arrange for them to have a free DNA test as part of my project. And they can see if they are from the Anglo-Norman surname, uh, the Anglo-Norman family, or if they're related to one of the other, many other um, Cruz families we have in Ireland. If you want any resources for DNA testing, the, the main resource is ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. You can visit our website, and we also have a wiki um, where you'll find information about all the different DNA tests and lots of links for books and uh, blogs and all sorts of other things. For um, One Name Studies, the, the Guild of One Name Studies, um, have, they run a, a lot of Guild members are now running DNA projects, so there's a, there are a lot of people who can offer advice. And we also have a lady in America who, who helps with the setup of surname projects. Um, and we also have occasional DNA seminars um, where we can all exchange information about our DNA projects. I wrote a book called DNA and Social Networking. Half the book is about DNA, and the other half is um, social networking, which is really a way of making those connections with the living people that we need for the DNA testing. And also another book I wrote on uh, the Surnames Handbook, which is really more how to research a surname, but there's a chapter in there on DNA testing and surname projects. So just to sum up, DNA testing is a useful tool for a surname study. 
but it must be used in combination with documentary records to get the best results. You have, it's very important to test people while you still have the chance. And it, when you start a DNA project, it really is for the long term, but you, you learn more and more as the project goes on, and each new project member seems to add a new dimension to the project. <laughs> and for some people it is a waiting game, some people have matches straight away, and other times they have to wait um, a long time before they get a match. But it does get very exciting when the results do start to come together, and you do have those matches, and you, it does help to break through your brick walls. And the other thing I've learned is if you find any castles in your family history, um, most of those are likely to be in ruins. Great. Thanks very much, Debbie. <laughs> So, if anybody has any questions for Debbie, like, yeah. Hi, Debbie. Uh, obviously, lots of connections, lots of DNA testing, lots of markers done. How much does this cost actually in terms of DNA testing? You're adding, do extra markers cost money when you're chasing up uh, SNPs and all of that? You know. Um, <laughs> well, the cost is coming down all the time. Um, it's. Um, I know with the Guild of One Main Studies, I should say we actually can buy the test at a discount. We get the test all year round at the 37 market test at a special sale price. Um, the, 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 um, the, the show price for the 37 market test is 99 euros. It does get more expensive when you do the 67 markers, but you can just, just spread out the cost over time. I've actually had people, because some people just become obsessed with it and they, they just want, keep wanting the answers. I've actually got a project member um, who's helping to fund some of my testing. So, and I've had a number of people who just made contributions simply because they want the answers. Um, the SNP testing is a difficult thing to, to know. Sometimes if you have a 67 marker test, um, if you join one of the Hapter Group projects, the Hapter Group project ad admins can predict the most downstream SNP from a six, it has to be a 67 mark Hapter type, usually. Um, and that's just 30, it's $39 to order a single SNP. That doesn't work in every case. Um, and also, at the moment, there are all sorts of new tests on the market. I'm going to be, um, there's a, there's now, you can now have the full Y chromosome sequence, but that would cost you over $1,000, and that still doesn't sequence the full Y chromosome, because no one's ever managed to do that. It's only about half of it, about 24 million base pairs. Um, but the costs are coming down and down all the time. But you, you spend the money, it's, it's small stages. Then with any family history research, you're always buying odd bits and pieces here and there, so... It doesn't really seem as much as you when it was. Can you get other members of the family to <laughs> Jared. Uh, Debbie, thank you for a lovely presentation. I noticed on some of your cruise names there you had a U152 as the terminal SNP. Right. Um, have you gone below that? And I, I would consider that sort of Alpine Celtic, which sort of originated in the Alpine area. But have you gone? Below that, and do you think that you'll get to a stage where you could identify a slip with a cruise name? Um, not on that one, we haven't. Um, I've tended to focus the slip testing on my own particular trees and left the other people to try and do their own testing. Um, they haven't actually been that interested in the deep ancestry aspects of it all, so I haven't. But um, with the full Y chromosome testing that's going through at the moment, there are the there are I think it's over a hundred people who've now taken this test, and the first results are starting to come through. I think we are one day going to have it's supposed to be about one snip every one and a half or two, every two or three generations. So we will eventually have a full branching process for every single man on the planet will be able to allocate every single person to a specific point on the tree but it depends on other people testing as well and working out where all those snips occur and no one we can't possibly get everyone to pay a thousand dollars to have their full y chromosome sequence at the moment perhaps in 10 years time it might cost 99 dollars to have the full y chromosome sequenced great um, in fact ben borrowman has um and the full sequence and his results might be revealed as well. Right, I know some of the results have started to come through now. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Uh, at the front here. Okay. All right, sure. I was uh, just interested to know whether you'd uh, done any research on Connor Cruise, O'Brien, to see if he fits anywhere with the cruise line. I haven't done 
done at the moment. No, that's something I ought to do. That might be interesting, yes. hasn't it? Because yes. generally the middle name yes. reflects somewhere yes. along the line. Yes. So thanks very much. Very interesting talk. I have a question here at the back as well. No, no, okay. Anybody else? Any, any other questions? Maybe we have one here. question here in the front. You said, yeah. I, I, may, I may have mistaken you, but I thought you said that um, the mail didn't change throughout the years. But I thought, I understood that it was the mitochondria, I think it is, in the female that doesn't change. Um, the that, yes, the, yes the, the mitochondrial DNA test is a different test altogether. That is the same, it, it works on the same principle because the mitochondrial DNA <coughs> is passed on from a mother to her children, but she passes it to her male and her female children. So either a man or a woman can take the mitochondrial DNA test. So if surnames are inherited on the female line, we'd all be running surname projects using mitochondrial DNA. It's just trace, it's based, uh, the Y DNA traces. One outer line, the mitochondrial DNA traces the other outer line of your family tree. And then the autosomal DNA does all the lines in between. Thank you. I've also written out, um, I'm from Australia, mm -hmm. but I've written out an Ian crew who sailed with me on the eye of the wind uh, around the Pacific. And uh, that's a little bit of his story that I Oh, know. right, okay. I've only tested two people with this surname crew, C R E W, at the moment, because there seem to be so many of them, and I'm not sure that they're actually. Related to, to mine, but I mean, if you want well, to, I might have the stunning one. Yeah. So oh, right, well, it's certainly be interesting. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. Fine, well, um, thanks, Teddy, for a fabulous uh, talk. Uh, it was really interesting to, to hear um, how the, the Irish cruises connect up with the English cruises and, and how the two countries are so interrelated from a genealogical perspective as well. So I'd just like to thank Debbie again and ask you to put your hands together. Thank you.